Hello, and welcome to Clock Spinning, the podcast of Magic's history as told card by card. I'm Austin, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Connor. How are you today, Connor? I'm doing pretty great. We uh, went to a fully automated, almost fully automated sushi restaurant last night, uh, and that got me kind of excited to talk about ninjas and spirits and all the wonderful Japanese themes of Kamigawa. Hmm. I feel like the kami of Kamigawa would not appreciate uh, automation. I mean, I think they probably came around to it by the time we got to Neon Dynasty. That's a great point. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe Magic will tell that story someday. The story of how the Kamigawa came to, go, came to peace with technology. <laughs> maybe. Uh, well, if you're new to the show, uh, you're joining us uh, about halfway through a card-by-card -card review of the original Kamigawa block. Uh, so we're going through each and every card. Uh, we're building a cube as we go. You can see a link to the cube as it is now on clockspinning.com. And we're talking about each card. Uh, so where does it fit into our cube? But also, what's its place in Magic's history? What's its place in EDH? And how is the art? Uh, how is the flavor? How does it make us feel mechanically? We're, we're trying to get into each and every card and find the little story that makes them interesting. And we believe most of these cards are interesting, even the ones that are really bad and maybe objectively not that cool. If you're brand new, uh, just start here. Uh, we think the show more or less explains itself. Um, if you do want to start from the beginning or listen to this and you want more, uh, you can either start on episode one, which is the very beginning of our Champions of Kamigawa block review, or episode 14 is where we kick off our Betrayers of Kamigawa review. And in that, we talk more about the design philosophy of the cube, the history of these sets, um, how we're rating the cards, uh, etc. One other note, uh, in the show notes, you're going to find a uh, link to a Scryfall search that will show you all the cards we're going to talk about today, or uh, you can go check out our YouTube channel. Uh, there's a video for each podcast. Um, and if you listen slash watch there, we'll throw up an image of each card as we talk about it. Other than that, though, Connor, uh, I don't know. Should we dive in and start talking about some uh, mostly pretty cool Betrayers of Kamigawa blue cards? Yeah, let's get it started. First up, we have Phantom Wings. This is one U for an enchantment aura, enchant creature. Enchanted creature has flying, and you can sacrifice Phantom Wings to return the enchanted creature to its owner's hand. Uh, the flavor text of this card reads, Many kami could fly, which put some warriors at a distinct disadvantage. The mages of Minamo took it upon themselves to correct that imbalance. And then the art which matches the flavor text so well, um, shows an ogre with these kind of glowing orange wings lifting the ogre up into the sky. The first thing that this card made me think of was why, why is there an ogre in the art and what does that have to do with the mages of Minamo? Like we haven't seen anything <laughs> on any card that suggests these guys even know each other. Uh, so the flavor text kind of sent me down this baffling rabbit hole on the Magic the Gathering fandom site which I knew was a bad idea as soon as I headed over there. And reading that just left me in, in utter confusion. I thought that maybe the ogre that was shown here was Hidetsugu, uh, who of course made an appearance in Champions of Kamigawa and came back in kind of a possessed Oni form in Neon Dynasty last year. So I thought maybe this is Hidetsugu. And then the flavor text says something about Minamo. So maybe there's some story arc about Hidetsugu teaming up with the mages of Minamo. Uh, and <laughs> Learning it turns how out to fly. And learning how to fly to fight Aww, the Kami. Inspiring. Uh, but it turns out that uh, Hidetsugu actually killed everyone in Minamo. So mm. I'm not really sure uh, not really sure what's supposed to be happening in the art and flavor text. Yeah, the, the flavor text art here feels like a bit of a stretch. I, I'm by far not an expert on Kamigawa lore, but yeah, I'm with you. The, one of the interesting things about Kamigawa, there's not like a lot of sense to me of the mortals like teaming up against the Kami threat. It's more like... Maybe some very loose alliances, but mostly, I don't know, everybody kind of going their own way. It's, it's different than like, I don't know, the Zendikar battle against the Eldrazi in that sense. It doesn't feel like the whole plane's united to me. Definitely not to this extent. And apparently they're not, if you if you look into the story. But the flavor text here definitely suggests that they are. The uh, the card, though, what do you think about the card here, Connor? I mean, it's it's vaguely interesting. Um I found this this surprisingly in-depth Reddit post uh, talking about this card, you know, whether whether it might have any place in a cube or in uh, any more competitive format. And a lot of people just pointed out, and I think exactly correctly, that there are, there are other cards that just do every kind of mode that this card does, but better. So there's cards that bounce in a better way than Phantom Wings, if that's what you're trying to do. There's cards that give flying in a more efficient way than Phantom Wings, if that's what you're trying to do. 
And it's just, it's hard to see the exact situation where you want to have both of those on one card that can only be played at sorcery speed. Giving the flying is something you typically want to do to your own creatures, and bouncing the creature is something you typically want to do to your opponent's creatures. Uh, so I'm not really sure what to make of it. Huh, I'm, I'm a lot higher on it. I don't think it's a particularly powerful card, but to me that flexibility is, you know, what makes it worth the somewhat, it's not really a particularly rough cost here either, like one U, yeah, I guess it could cost a single blue, but for Kamigawa, like two mana is a pretty doable cost. Um, and I think that mixed mode here where it can either help your best ground creature get through or help remove an opponent's creature for a turn or two or help re-enable a ninja or perhaps an enter the battlefield trigger. I feel like you put all that together um, and save the uh, enchanted creature from removal. Like this does four things not amazing, but I think like doing four things not amazing is uh, that has some value in and of itself. Like I both from a um, power level perspective, but also I think from a design perspective, I think it's uh it's fun design to have a card that's flexible uh, in the ways that this card is flexible. Uh, it poses interesting deck building and gameplay questions. Yeah, I do. I do kind of appreciate that it has these different modes in a very uncomplicated, uh, low text, low text, and I guess low tech kind of way. Like it just <laughs> gives flying, but it it also has you know removal potential or saving your own creature potential. So I do, you know, it feels kind of elegant in that sense that it has all of these ways it can be used without throwing a wall of text at you. I, I like that you brought that up because to me that um, that gets at a kind of ongoing thing we've noticed in this show of, you know, that there's a certain elegance to older magic cards that's lost, I think, a little bit today because of complexity creep of this card doesn't um, doesn't read complicated, but I think in terms of actual play, uh, it enables lots of interesting things. And that to me is what makes magic special as a game. So I, I got a soft spot for it. I also like that it's a reprint from Weatherlight. It's one of these kind of sneaky reprints that you wouldn't necessarily think of as a reprint. Uh, I have one other observation about the flavor text, actually. Um, many kami could fly. It's been a persistent complaint of ours throughout these reviews that there are lots of kami that look like they have flying, but don't. And this feels like just salt in the wound to me. I'm like, stop. <laughs> we, you, you're, you shouldn't lampshade this. This is bad. Anyway. <laughs> it really is. I guess we're supposed to give those kami the phantom wings <laughs> instead of the ogres. <laughs> huh, that would kind of make more flavor sense, I feel like. It feels like yeah. a kami effect to give phantom wings. Yeah, the, we'll we'll see a few cards today <laughs> that, that really feel that way. You know, for all my hedging at the beginning, I actually have this at a meh rating and think that maybe even two in the cube might be fine. May, I'm, I'm torn between one and two copies. I, I like the idea of giving blue just a little bit of extra flying as an option and maybe something that can be easily splashed in. I like the contrast here because I was higher on it, but I'm a meh 1x and you were lower on it, but you're a meh 2x. I have this at a 1x just because I, I still don't think it's an exceptional card. And also every time I look at the cube and I see that we have 630 cards, I think there's going to be some cuts coming up at some point. Uh, and this doesn't really feel like an effect that we need. We need in the cube. It's more like having one of them running around will lead to some interesting moments. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Meh 1x. Yeah, my 1X works for me. Do it. All right, let's talk about another sneaky reprint. Quash. Quash is 2UU for an instant. Counter target instant or sorcery spell. Search its controller's graveyard, uh, hand, and library for all cards with the same name as that spell and exile them. Then that player shuffles. Uh, so one of my beefs with Kamigawa, there have been a lot of beefs with Kamigawa today. I should say I love it, but they're, they're, I have beefs too. Um, one of my beefs with Kamigawa is just how bad the counter spells are. You know, they're mostly three or even four mana. Uh, many of them are very narrow or like this card, they're just four mana and include such a marginal upside that the extra text scarcely even matters. Um, particularly in, I think, a limited environment. Like our cube isn't singleton, but it's close-ish to singleton. So the the up text, up the uh, additional text here like really is just a thing that slows down the game and it adds like annoyance to play as much as anything. <laughs> anyway, and this is a broader beef I have with Kamigawa was like, to me, counter spells are a core part of blue's color identity. And this comes smack dab in the middle of a long period where wizards is really clamping down on counter spells, except for accidentally printing and remand and not realizing how good it was going to be. And uh, it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work like this era of magic, especially needs blue to have counter spells because blue doesn't have a whole lot else going on. <laughs> Well, it, it's interesting that you you mentioned the the sort of upside of this of being able to search, uh, you know, your opponent's graveyard in their hand, their library for everything with the same name and get rid of them. But this is also a very limited counterspell. It only targets instants and sorceries. 
So it's a it's a four mana counter spell that can't even counter a creature or an artifact or an enchantment. Just two card types. Right. It's even more limited than negate, which is already a very limited. Or there's many times in cube I've had a negate in my hand. This is not doing what I need. And you're right. This is like ultra ultra narrow. Like there's many. Yeah. Like this is just dead against green and pretty dead against white. Yeah. Absolutely. Speaking of reprints, this is actually also a reprint and is part of a uh, five color cycle of reprints in this set uh, that I've seen called the Lobotomy Cycle, um, originally printed in Urza's Destiny. So in our uh, one of our white episodes recently, we talked about, uh, yeah, Scour, which removes target enchantment from the game and then has the same effect of searching the library, the hand, the graveyard for everything with the same name and getting rid of those too. One of those four mana, uh, like uber hate cards in every color in Betrayers of Kamigawa that were all reprinted from Urza's Destiny. Yeah. Do you know why this? I mean, maybe Wizards doesn't says, but like, why did this get a reprint? It just seems like such a random cycle of cards. Like, I don't think anyone was crying out to see these cards come back. Well, uh, this is again from a fandom article and it is uh, attributed to an unsighted Mark Rosewater quote. Okay. But supposedly these were reprinted to deal with uh, issues in standard at the time that were caused by cards like Eternal Witness or Char Belcher, Cloud Post. So there's, you can kind of see how some of these cards deal with those. Like the red version uh, of this card, Sowing Salt, is a, a land hating card. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure these were ever played to do that. Uh, but in theory, that's why they're there. Yeah, that gets at another key theme of Kamigawa, right? Like printing hate cards for Mirrodin that didn't actually manage to to deal with the sheer power level of Mirrodin. Also, I'm not sure what the instant or sorcery would have been that Quash was dealing with, but I guess, you know, if you're going to print three cards from that cycle, you might as well go all the way. Yeah, it's only very, very recently that Watsi even considered printing incomplete cycles. Um, and I'm, I'm glad they did, because when you go through these older sets, they're like, they're just a lot of cycles and they don't always earn... Uh, this card and actually the next card we're going to talk about are examples where like sometimes a certain color just doesn't have something interesting to do within a particular de- uh, cycle design space. So where do you land on on quash? Do you, do you think we need to quash it or should we have some in? I think we need to quash it. I mean, I just don't. There's not that many instants and sorceries that are worth playing, let alone worth countering. Apart from like Rend Flesh, Rend Spirit, like the key black removal spells, there's not, it's just not that much that's worth spending four mana. Four mana is a lot to leave up, like a lot, a lot of mana to leave up. You're almost always going at like losing mana on the exchange. I don't think the exiling additional copies is going to matter very often. I don't see any reason to include this card, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I think we got to cut it. Yeah, it's one of the really unfortunate things is like blue does not really have very many good reactive spells. Um, even though the moon folk like really set you up to play an interesting reactive game where they you hold up mana and either trigger the moon folk ability or trigger uh, or cast some kind of instant. But the the actual instants of the block just do not hold up their end of the bargain. Mm-mm. Insta cut. Insta cut. Okay, we have uh, another cycle right now actually with Quillmain Baku. For you, for a 3-3 spirit, whenever you cast a spirit or arcane spell, you may put a key counter on Quillmain Baku. Uh, it's an ability that's often called spirit crap. Uh, and then you can pay one colorless mana and tap the Baku, and then remove X key counters from Quillmain Baku to return target creature with mana value X or less to its owner's hand. So a little bit to unpack there. Basically, you get key counters on your Baku whenever you play a spirit or arcane spell, and then you can pay a little bit of mana, tap the Baku, remove some key counters to bounce a creature uh, with mana cost X or less. Um, so we talked about the white Baku already, Wax Mane Baku, which taps creatures. And now we have Quill Mane, which is significantly more expensive at five mana and just bounces a single creature. To me, this feels a lot worse than Wax Mane. Yeah, I was I started in Instacut on this. I liked your um the Baku or Baku uh comment or note. Uh I also had the Baku or more like Baka, which is the Japanese word for idiot. Um Look I don't at know. Us. I, I know, terrible. Uh so I, at first I was like this this Baku is a Baka uh in a couple of senses. One, it's very expensive, which is a disadvantage on these kind of uh spirit craft uh cards. Spirit craft is a keyword essentially in the set that isn't a keyword. There's lots and lots of things that trigger off casting spirit and arcane spells my experience playtesting this cube is spirit craft is kind of harder to achieve than it looks like you picture it and you think oh i'm just going to be spirit crafting like basically every turn or two but and a lot of times you're 
like spirit crafting two to three times over the course of a game. And this guy comes down too late to benefit from a lot of your early spirit spirit and arcane spells. Uh, it's brutal that he has to tap. I'm not as into the art as some of the other Baku. I like how wacky it is, but it's just a little bit amateurish. So I was originally like, yeah, let's just cut this thing. But then I found an interesting contemporary article from uh, Star City Games that said, this thing is better than you'd think. I'll just read this. Uh, Quillmane Baku is better than you'd think. I once beat someone who had a Yobi who split the heavens and play for like eight turns. And the MVP of that game was Quillmane Baku. Look for opportunities to return stuff that cost zero, including your opponent's land, if you have Soil Shaper or they have a Genju. And don't forget that if you have more than one Baku or other spirit or arcane dependent card, you can cast and return a 1-1 spirit like Kami of False Hope every turn to get more spirit craft triggers. He's versatile, like a summer dress with two different but complementary tones. Suitable for lounging at the park or dining out. You might even say that this card is my main man. That's main like a lion's mane. That's Jordy Tate. Um, so first, uh, I, something about this card seems to inspire bad puns. Um, second, I like the summer dress uh, comparison. But third, I actually really liked particularly the idea that you're using this to repeatedly pick up like a one mana bad spirit in order to just keep on getting spirit craft triggers every single turn. That actually sounded kind of fun and interesting. So I, I talked myself up to a man on this thing. A one X man. Okay, that is, that is kind of an interesting use for it to just sort of keep triggering your spirit craft and then of course you get the spirit craft on the baku too i kind of like the idea of that but i mean i also feel like by the time you're playing a baku you're hoping for something with a lot more impact yeah that's asking you to grind pretty hard that's for sure yeah you're grinding pretty hard to be able to like play kami of false hope again again <laughs> well yeah but then you get your soil shaper triggers and you get your uh -huh. um, uh your other baku triggers and you get yeah. uh you get your sire of the storm trigger and you draw cards that all sounds great if you somehow get all of those and you're still like playing the game i don't know yeah it, it's interesting that this baku has to tap and the black baku also has to tap which is funny because they're the two most expensive ones at five mana. The cheaper Baku don't have to tap to use their removing key counters ability, mm -hmm. which means you could use them multiple times a turn and you know potentially target multiple things and split up the key counters a little bit. I wonder, you know, what the logic was in making the blue and black ones tap. Like the the potential for them to be doing any kind of mass removal seems pretty limited by the number of key counters you have. And it doesn't seem that horrible to have your quill made Baku bouncing multiple things at one time, given how long it probably takes you to get key counters. Yeah, I well, let's think about it. So I think one problem with the quill main, right, if we think about that Kami of False Hope example, you could just keep uh, picking it up and recasting it as long as you have two mana over and over to get like three or four Spearcraft triggers a turn, which maybe that's OK, but it does seem a little good for Kamigawa. But yeah. I think the main concern here is just the, you know, they don't want you goblin sharpshootering your opponent's board out of the way and then alpha striking, I assume. Um, I get it more for the skull main, the black one, which just gives minus X minus X. Like that could be, uh, if you could do that three times in a turn, like creatures in Kamigawa are not very big, like minus X minus X, you could. That makes a little more sense to me. It, it has, It's a little bit inelegant, I guess. It, um, even though I was just complaining about excess symmetry in cycles, humans like symmetry. I do wish they all tapped or didn't tap, but. Yeah, just just feels a little weird. It's fine. We'll get over it. Yeah, we can recover. So, uh, where, what's your rating on this, Connor? I've got it. I've got it at a meh one X. I think mostly just because I like the Baku and I want them to be around so we can actually have chances to try playing them. I also like it. To me, it's kind of like the Phantom Wings case. If it's not an amazing card, but it does enable a lot of things, and that's the kind of play pattern I want to create in the cube. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. All right, let's lock, let's lock it in at Meh 1X. Let's do it. All right, let's talk about Reduce to Dreams. 3UU for a sorcery. Return all artifacts and enchantments to their owner's hand. Uh, and then the flavors text. Uh, the flavor text. This world is a dream. We cling to our toys like children, but sooner or later, we must learn to live without them. Sensei Hisoka. Uh, so let's. I think we can get the obvious out of the way. Uh, Connor, I don't think this makes the cut in our cube, right? Uh, that's safe to say. Okay. Um, let's talk about this in other environments then. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me is that this card shows up almost not at all in EDH. It's only in, I think, a few hundred decks when I checked. It's only in 276 decks on EDH rec. Now, I don't think this card's amazing, but as a, like, 
kind of blue wrath for artifacts and enchantments like that also lets you maybe pick up your own stuff and recast it and get more triggers like i'm pretty surprised that this doesn't show up in just more casual low power edh decks as a kind of multi-function disrupting tool slash enable your own combos thing it, it's really weird to me this doesn't show up in like i don't know a bant enchantress deck or an artifact a synergy deck or something like that yeah i noticed that that too it's it, like obviously the the power potential of this is so much higher in edh where you're hitting three other players boards with it it is like an extremely fringe pick with a couple of very popular commanders uh, like joyra weatherlight captain I, I'm not totally sure why. I, I guess this would let you replay historic spells to work with Joyra. I can see it with Joyra, right? It's like artifacts, but then sagas or enchantments. So yeah, yeah there's yeah. some synergy. And you, she wants you to cast those spells again. So yeah, I can see it. It lets you re, re-roll, a, re-roll your sagas, right? It, I mean, that's that's asking a lot of you in terms of setup. Yeah, uh, Like the timing has to be really good there, but there's something. Yeah, yeah, that's probably why this only appears in 27 of the 4,857 <laughs> Joyra decks, but, you know. Yeah, I see. It's 0.56% EDH rack, helpfully informs me. You know, there's a few people doing it on the fringe. So, yeah, I'm not not sure why that is. What I am sure about is that I'm really bothered that this is not an arcane spell. Like, everything about this screams Kami meddling, right? Like, reduced to dreams, that name sounds like something the Kami would be doing. It sounds like an arcane spell. The art shows these very human-looking artifacts kind of melting away. The flavor text even says, This world is a dream. We cling to our toys like children, but sooner or later we must learn to live without them, like suggesting that the Kami are taking these things away. So everything about this makes it look like it should be an arcane spell, and then it's not. And I don't know why. Well, I think I do know why. I I think it's another example where they probably thought this would be evergreen right they probably thought like wrath of god that this would be slotted in and out of core sets for the next decade and so they couldn't make it arcane and i think that's that's one of the design problems with arcane is that in a lot of ways if a card with arcane is going to be really good and interesting and some a tool wizards wants to use again they can't really make it arcane right so like that, i think that's part of why a lot of the arcane spells are bad and then some of the cooler spells in the block that feel arcane like reduced to dreams or sway of the stars we're going to talk about later they're not arcane because if they ever want to use them again they can't i don't know it's just this weird catch 22 problem with arcane card design yeah, yeah. It, it comes back to something we were talking about probably in one of the first couple of episodes, um, you know, about how parasitic the set design is in, in Kamigawa. And there's so many mechanics and themes and concepts that are so cool, like ninjas, ninjutsu, arcane spells, spirits, like wacky art, wacky names for creatures that are so cool in this context, but that just cannot be reused in other sets because they're so specific to the the world that was being created here. Yeah, and I think, you know, that ultimately limited Kamigawa's, you know, reach and cultural uh, impact within magic, right? It took, what, f- six, 15 years, 17 years, something like 17 years for uh, uh, Kamigawa to show back up, which is a very long time for a magic plane to take, uh, to roll back into to favor. And I think part of it is that a, a lot of its most iconic cards never showed up again because they're so specific to Kamigawa. Yeah. All right. It's the cut, right? It's the cut. Yeah. Cool card. I put it put it in the EDH deck and then tell us how bad it is. We're we're curious. Okay. Now we do have an arcane spell. This is ribbons of the Reikai. for you for a sorcery arcane. Draw a card for each spirit you control, and then the flavor text says, "If wisdom is a river." Then we cup our hands, reach in, and drink from it in sips. The kami, however, are like fish, swimming, breathing, surrounded in its presence. Dose on the falling leaf. So I just I just have to say, and get it out of the way right at the top here, um, Dosan says the kami are like fish swimming through this river of wisdom. Um, those do not look like fish. I won't say what they look like, <laughs> uh, but it's not fish. Yeah, uh, that was my first comment as well. Is we're not we're not here to talk about the green ribbons in the art, um, nope. or the unfortunate correspondence between those and the flavor text. We're we're just here to talk about every other aspect of this card. Yep, yep. So we're just gonna set that aside. <laughs> yeah, let's just keep um, moving. Uh, just move right along. So I was wondering, looking at this card, of course, the first question that comes to mind is how many spirits are you actually gonna control? Like how good 
will Ribbons of the Reikai be? How good can it possibly be in the kind of ideal scenario? So I decided to go and look at the admittedly fairly limited data that we have from people's test drafts of the cube on Cube Cobra, which we do have a record of, and it's pretty cool. Uh, and from what I was looking at, it seems like the average cube deck that people have drafted and put together has somewhere between five and eight spirits on average. It seems pretty unlikely to me that you'll ever get more than three of those to stick at any given time. So I would guess that this is sort of fairly good case scenario, like a five mana draw two and a half cards, maybe. Of course, sometimes it's also a five mana draw zero cards, a little bit like our friend <laughs> Heed the Mists from last episode. Mm. So I think in in that kind of average scenario, I think this is probably fine. Yeah, I think this is probably fine as well. I, I like that you crunched the numbers there because, yeah, my my gut is that this is netting you probably two to four cards in an average deck that's trying to make it draw cards. One of the things I like about it is that it gives you another reason to prioritize spirits in your pick order. Um, I, one of the things I've noticed in test draft is that Kamigawa is trying to pull you into choosing a side, right, between the spirit arcane decks on one side and the mortal decks on the other. But in practice, the card quality is such that it's pretty easy to just go, well, this this is a like a six drop with flying. This is what I'm picking. Um, and so I think anything that kind of helps like tease out those spirit arcane versus non-spirit arcane distinctions is is a useful design tool to have in our tool belt. I mean, this isn't an incredible reward, but it it's something. You know, if anyone ever manages to get this to go like four cards, five cards, it's really big game. I don't know that that's common, but maybe the the fantasy of that is enough to pull someone a little closer to the spirit deck. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I You know, for all the story being about uh, the spirit world turning against the mortal world and, and this huge war between the two sides, in reality, you just kind of draft whatever creature is going to be the strongest or work with what you already have, whether it's a spirit or a mortal. And because the mortals don't really, especially across the different sort of mortal tribes, they don't really have any sort of synergy. There's no, you know, mortal equivalent to spirit craft or to arcane spells. So I think any anything we can do to kind of push that spirit archetype a little bit more and reward that is good. Yeah, it is a little awkward to have this in blue because honestly, blue spirits mostly are really bad. Like a lot, blue's best creatures to me are the moon folk and the ninjas, not its spirits. Like most of its spirits suck. So I don't know. There's yeah. like a, there's a, there's a tension or a problem there, I think. Well, they're expensive too. Like the good spirits that blue has, you know, they're yeah. not one or two drops. They're like four mana plus <laughs> flyers and stuff like that. So it's a little tough. Uh, one thing that's fun about this card is it uh, it has somewhat decent play in Commander. It shows up in around 2,000 decks, 1745, which is not a ton, but it's not it's more than I would have expected. It seems to show up in, yes, the various kind of Kamigawa um, theme decks like Cloud Hoof, Kirin, the Unspeakable, Okogachi, but it also shows up in uh, some spirit-focused commanders like Geist of St. Traft, Millicent, Restless Revenant, Ronar, the Ever Watchful, Kaikar, Winds Fury. Like It shows up in low play in a bunch of different spirit decks, which I think is is fun uh, and it does show off I, I feel like one of the memes of this show for me is that i uh, i'm hard on commander but that illustrates something i like about commander if there are better versions of this card like distant melody for example in morning tide is 3u for a sorcery choose a creature type draw a card for each permanent you control of that type that is strictly better in every single way. The mana cost is better. The fact that it lets you choose your, the type of creature is better. I guess the fact it doesn't have arcane. It's not arcane. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, but that means it's it's immune to anything that specifically uh, like counters arcane spells. <laughs> does anything do that? <laughs> I think there's one card that does it. The one mortal theme card. Anyway, I, yeah, I think that's a, that's kind of fun that this has a, a little home in Commander despite being a pretty bad card. Yeah. And it also means more people have to look at this uh, wonderful, ridiculous art. It does. And and speaking of this wonderful, ridiculous art, if you're at all interested in trying a test draft of the uh, cube that we have up on Cube Cobra, uh, please do it. It It is fun. It's it's an interesting way to kind of get a, a whirlwind tour of these cards and see how they do and, and don't work together. And it also, you know, helps us learn a little bit more about the cube. 
Yeah. And if as you do that, you have thoughts, uh, let, let us know in a Reddit comment or email us clockspinningpodcast at gmail.com or we're in both of the uh, both the Cube Cobra and the MTG Cube Talk discords. You can just uh, discord us. Oh, did we rate this thing, Connor? I don't think we did rate it. Okay. Uh, I had it. I, I'm going to sneakily change my rating and I'm going to put this in a build around 1x. This feels like a build around card to me. Oh, interesting. I also have it as a 1x, but I had it at meh. And I'm just going to foreshadow a little bit and say there's a lot of meh in this episode so i like shifting over to build around uh, and we'll just say for any uh, any new listeners there are episodes where we review better cards so you know if you want one of those just go check out the backlog look at the uh, seven man enchantments episodes or uh, other colors uh now that i'm uh, done ragging on this episode let's talk about shimmering glass kite three and a u for a two three spirit flying Whenever a shimmering glass kite becomes the target of a spell or ability for the first time each turn, counter that spell or ability. And then the flavor text, a child's whisper could crack its shell, but not even an Oni's scream could penetrate it. So this is part of a uh, a vertical cycle, um, the glass kite cycle. So we have a shimmering glass kite, this thing at common. We have jetting glass kite, uh, which we reviewed last episode at uncommon and Kira, the great glass spinner at rare. This is uh, as befitting the common card. It is by far the worst and most boring of the cards in this cycle. I think that's true on the art. I think that's true on the power level. I think it's true on just excitement looking at it. That said, I think this weirdly is still a pretty playable card. Um, I keep going back and forth basically between meh 2x because this does seem like a valuable glue card for the spirit deck in blue. It's just like an okay four drop that will win you some games and blocks all right um and thinking okay this is an insta cut it's just like super boring like i i don't i don't know connor i think this is totally playable but it's hard to get excited about it yeah i uh, completely agree i think i would be more excited about it if it was maybe a four mana three two i think it would certainly be better if it was uh but like two three just it doesn't it doesn't feel like something i want to protect with, with this this glass kite signature ability here i think also the fact that it well, can i pause you actually I, I i'm curious about that because i actually like that it's a two three versus a three two i feel like um this this thing blocks pretty okay and that's a lot of what i want in my early mid game blue cards like this blocks all right and then once i've got the game kind of on lock i don't really care if it's a two three or three two because i'm i'm presuming that i'll just hold hold down the fort and slowly chip in for damage so i'm curious about two three versus three two well, I mean, I, I think if you look at the other creatures that we have in blue, they are they tend to weight a little more toward high toughness as opposed to high power, right? Like the next card we're going to look at, Sword Tommy Minesweeper, is a 1-4. Uh, we'll have another creature later on in this episode that's a 1-5. We've seen a decent number of 1-2s, but there aren't that many creatures that lean toward more power or putting your opponent under more pressure. So I feel like I would rather have the 3-2 because it has this extra protection. I don't necessarily need to worry as much about protecting it from, let's say, a glacial ray because it's going to, the first glacial ray is just going to bounce off of this. And the three damage coming in every turn feels like a much bigger threat. We we did a test draft recently and we had a game where I was just kind of hitting you over and over with lantern commies, <laughs> uh, which is a, a one man, a one, one flyer. <laughs> That I mean, that's hardly a clock. <laughs> it was embarrassing how well it worked. <laughs> it, it it really worked. And just thinking about if if those lantern kami had instead had three power and this protection ability, you know that that game could have been ten minutes instead of twenty five minutes or however long it took to finally finish you off with those. Hmm. So what's your what's your rating on this, then, Connor? I'm a I'm a mad two x right now, but I'm I've been waffling constantly. Uh, I mean, okay, I. Now I'm feeling a little bit like I'm I'm caught with my pants down. I feel like I should have done a little more homework on what our blue creatures actually are right now because I'm, like you said, I'm kind of waffling between meh, one or two of these. And on the other hand, maybe just getting rid of it completely because it's it's so unexciting. Well, so a lot of our blue four drop creatures we've yet to raid. Weirdly, we've only raided two that are still in the cube. Those are Ninja of the Deep Hours. Um, which is only sort of a four drop. And then Soratami Savant, which is a four mana 2-2 two, two flyer, uh, Moonfolk that counters spells. And then we've got a whole bunch of additional uh, four drops to come in Saviors, um, which, uh, spoiler, most of them are not very good. Um, so our, our four drop slot in blue is um, not overwhelmingly strong. Okay, so then then maybe we do need a couple of these. I, I think we might need like one or two just as kind of curve fillers in the middle of the curve for blue. Yeah. Okay. Should we say meh 2x then? 
Yeah, I think 1x, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those we could just turn the knob however we want, right? But I think yeah. if I look back at how, what, something I've noticed is if I look back how we approach champions, um, we brought in a lot of kind of basic glue cards in relatively large quantities. So for mm-hmm. example, uh, we've got three Lantern Commies cube. And that's not because either of us think Lantern Kami is an amazing card, but because we just think it's essential to kind of making the curve work for white. Or similarly, we've got three Nazumi Cutthroats, which is a two mana, two one fear uh, rat warrior that can't block. Again, that's in there not because we think we need three Nazumi Cutthroats per se, but because... Um, it just helps create a deck in black. And I feel like this kind of helps create a kind of annoying hold down the fort blue spirit rather than Soratami kind of deck. And it helps your Ribbons of the Reikai. That's right. Yeah, it turns on Ribbons of the Reikai, uh, which is huge. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's all about. All right, Matt, do we just talk ourselves to like a Matt 2X on I this think, thing? Yeah, I think we do want two of them. All right, let's do it. Oh, and before we move on, anything to say about the art here? I, I liked the other two glass kites more. I think Jetting Glass Kite has just incredible art. We were super high on that. And I liked Kira just for its callbacks to older magic art and its kind of Kev Walker photorealism. This one, I don't know. It's just kind of boring. It's just like a monster in a bubble. Doesn't doesn't do much for me. Yeah, here's here's the the comment that I wrote to myself about about this card and the art. Enigmatic and sort of meaningless flavor text. Plus, characteristically horrifying art with disembodied limbs and appendages equals peak Kamigawa. <laughs> that's that's about all I've got. <laughs> this isn't doing anything for me. I'm with you, except maybe not peak Kamigawa, right? It's just like baseline Kamigawa. Yeah, it's it's like just what what we've come to expect from a, a Kamigawa spirit. All right, let's lock it down. Matt 2X. All right. Okay, so speaking of four mana blue creatures, uh, we have one... Right here in Soratami Mind Sweeper. Not Mind Sweeper, Mind Sweeper. Uh, this is a 1 4 Moonfolk Wizard with flying. You can pay two colorless mana and return a land you control to its owner's hand to have target player mill two cards. <sighs> so this is, <laughs> this is uh, another mill card in Kamigawa that just does not do anything. This doesn't synergize with. One of the few other mill cards that we talked about in our Champions Blue review, Dampen Thought. I think the the problem I have with this card is that it mills only two cards at a, a pretty enormous cost. And there's just nothing that it pairs with in this set or even this block. Yeah, there's this kind of like tease in Kamigawa around like mill where there's, I don't know, there's like four or five cards that kind of do milly things. You know, there's this thing. There's uh, Dampened Thought, as you said. There's Hairstrung Kodo. There's mm-hmm. uh, Ornate Kanzashi. But all of them mill, like, not enough cards too late in the game for too much mana. Uh, and it's just, it's, like, I don't want to include them because I feel like they sort of, they're trap cards, right? I think, like, a drafter, uh, an inexperienced drafter, which, incidentally, I think is all draft, almost all our drafters, right? Because not a lot of people have done a lot of Kamigawa draft recently, let alone our kind of specific uh, take on it. Like to me, this implies the existence of a mill deck that just isn't there, and so I think that alone makes this an insta cut for me. I, plus, it's boring. Like it's just a boring card. It's uh, it's definitely not getting there on stats either. I do think this card has some could be fun. Like if he drawn crab somehow existed in betrayers, like then we'd be talking, right? Like pick up your lands, mill two, play the land again, mill with he drawn crab, pick up the lands back with Sora Tommy. Like that would be kind of cute. Um, or if there was like general landfall synergies in this, that's kind of a miss in general with this set, right? Is uh, there's all these Sora Tommy that want to bounce lands, but it would be cool if there were rewards for replaying your lands. So there's really not, there's not like landfall abilities in this set. Right. You you don't get anything except the ability that triggers when you bounce the land. And and you get equity and savers of Kamigawa from having more cards in your hand. That's Connor. that's true. That's true. Uh it's a it's a very slow, small payoff most of the time, but yeah, it's there. Okay. Yeah. So so we we just insta cutting this? Yeah, I mean yes. All right. Okay, let's talk about stream of consciousness. One you for an instant arcane. Target player shuffles up to four target cards from their graveyard into their library. And then the flavor text, all things return to their beginnings. The waters that spill across the Kamitaki Falls flow to the sea, only to be returned to her as the rain that joins the mighty river. Dosan, the falling leaf. 
Connor, I, I'm starting to feel like almost physical pain at this point because I so, so dearly want there to be like an arcane deck in the cube. But like mm-hmm. so many of these blue arcane spells, are they're just not cards. Like this card is not, not a card. There's no card advantage here, right? There is card disadvantage. You go down cards here in the hope, I guess, that you can redraw your best things later because you're in like a super grindy like mirror match or your opponent is milling you. Like I like this is just this is just a non-card. And that this feels like the problem with like half of the arcane spells in the cube is there's just there's no reason to put them into your deck. And so there's nothing to splice onto. Like it just drives me bananas. Kind of a theme we've returned to over and over through these episodes is considering whether we need to consciously up the number of arcane spells that we have just so we have spells that things can be spliced onto. You're exactly right. So many of the arcane spells are just do nothing. And, you know, it's it's not like we can throw this in the cube uh, to have it do nothing and basically be a, a two mana spell that is just is arcane like that's that's his whole purpose in life right it's kind of like are you supposed to just throw so many cards that do nothing in there that eventually they do something maybe is this meant to be part of dampen thought this is a way to recur your dampen thoughts uh and your um your uh lanterns glow <laughs> maybe D- does this set up the unspeakable somehow uh no. <laughs> it just Maybe. goes back to the library. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I was I was and am a little bit scared of this card because it felt like just from the, the weirdness of the effect, the, the nicheness of the effect, it felt like it might be like part of some weird modern combo deck or something. Oh, scared because we'll look like frauds because right. we don't know about the right. Like yeah, I, I feel the same way. This card feels so bad. It's like it can't be this bad, right? Yeah. Like I'm doubting myself. Yeah, it's like there there must be something here I'm missing. It it like it's the same sort of feeling that I had all the time when we first started playing Magic, you know, two decades ago. That you look at a card and you think, like, oh, I mean, it can't be bad. There, it must just be that I I haven't found the right situation to play this card in. And once I do, then you know, I'll discover how this card is good. I have not found any evidence of any <laughs> modern or other combo deck that has ever done anything with this card. If any of our listeners know of that deck, please do tell us so I can uh, shake this this fear um <laughs> this misplaced fear uh but i i think this is just two mana do nothing yeah there uh there's this energy in this era of magic of like uh principal skinner from the simpsons like uh the children who are it must be the children who are wrong like it must be the players who are wrong of like we're giving you these cards <laughs> they're you know you all are supposed to figure out why they're good they, they are Make good the like deck I, yeah i I don't think they are. I want to stall for a little bit because now I'm I'm still riddled with self doubt. I want to talk about the art here. It's really interesting to me. So it's uh it's kind of anime. Like I get kind of an Avatar: The Last Airbender vibe from it. It's got this super prominent, yeah. shadowy uh, Tory gate, and then uh, I presume a monk experiencing a stream of consciousness with all these kind of sort of anime ish ribbons of energy flowing around and through him. Uh, and what I find fascinating is one, I like it. I like the Tory Gate. I like the unusual style. And two, this is a John Avon piece. Oh wow! I didn't. I didn't notice that it was John Avon. I was going to mention that Shimmering Glass Kite was also John Avon, and like those are these are pretty strongly contrasting art pieces here. Yeah, he's really he was really branching out. Like uh, we all know him as the kind of lands and landscape artist, but uh, there's a lot of he he did some funky stuff in Kamigawa. It's a it's a cool one. I I like how it, it's just kind of all silhouette except for this very bright light right around the monk's head and these these ribbons of I guess consciousness going into his head. So it, it looks really cool. I wish this card actually did something so we could look at the art more during playtesting. All right, do we do we think there's some kind of build around dampened thought deck rating here, or is this just just bad and we should just cut it and move on? Well, I, I think we cut all the dampened thoughts, so... Okay, that's going to make it tough to build around it then. We can probably get rid of this, yeah. Okay, all right, it's the cut. All right, we've got a, a very interesting, very expensive spell coming up here. Sway of the Stars. This is a sorcery for 8 UU. Each player shuffles their hand, graveyard, and all permanents they own into their library, then draws 7 cards. Each player's life total becomes 7. Um, so the very first thing I noticed about this card is that it's banned in EDH. I'm not really sure why. I found a, a couple of discussions online about you know why this card is banned and whether it needs to be. It doesn't seem to me like it really needs to be banned in Commander. 
Um, it's not that much more annoying than some other cards that are legal and do kind of a similar game resetting effect to Sway of the Stars. Uh, and I honestly, I sort of feel like if you pull this off at 10 mana and then you have some kind of follow up to finish the game after that, like you deserve it. Yeah, I'm a little puzzled by the EDH ban as well. Like, I get it from a sort of play perspective, right? It's sort of Scheherazade-like and that it sort of invalidates the game. So I get that. But then, like, Worldfire and the Great Aurora are not that far off of this effect, and they're legal. And there is, I feel like this is a combo card, right? It's meant to do a kind of upheaval thing where you float a ton of mana, nominally reset the game, but actually set yourself up way ahead uh, and either win immediately or win, like, on the crackback. So I, I don't know, this feels like another example of the commander ban list being sort of the product of a few individual minds um, and deeply eccentric uh, with rule zero being an excuse for all kinds of inconsistencies. Like this card seems like it would be obnoxious, but no more obnoxious than plenty of legal cards. That pretty much sums up what I've got on Sway of the Stars. I, I, it obviously does nothing in the format that we're most interested in here, which is our cube. Yeah, I I don't have a whole lot here either because it's this kind of cool card that doesn't really have a home in any particular format. Like this, this is an obvious commander card, but since it's been illegal for command in commander for most of commander's organized existence, it's never really had much home. It looks like it saw some fringe standard play from what I can tell with like um, Heartbeat of Spring, or like a rampy uh, go over the top deck. So that's kind of cool. But other than that, I, I can't really find anything. This is another example of, uh, you know, cards that were cool and casual 60 card 1v1 magic that don't have a home. There's a lot of people on Gatheru who just talk about doing things with like phasing, right? You like play this, but you phased out all of your lands the turn before with this obscure phase out all your lands thing from, I don't know, Tempest or something. And then your lands phase in, but your opponent doesn't have their lands or it's cool with suspend, right? It lets you suspend. Um, a bunch of stuff, and then that comes off uh, suspend, and your opponent gets got. Um, or you can use it with Joy Rid to suspend this thing. Uh, it's cool with High Tide, right? Because you can double up your mana and get to this way earlier than you should, and rebuild faster. So there's there's a lot of fun, interesting shenanigans this thing can do, but not in any way that exists in modern Magic. Not in any especially competitive way. Yeah, and as you said, not really in a way that can exist in our cube. Like it's pretty much uncastable. And we don't have any fast mana or shenanigans to break this thing. So sadly, I think this is an insta-cut here, as it seems to be everywhere. Yep, goodbye, Sway of the Stars. I will say, this has never been reprinted. If it ever comes off the commander ban list, I suspect it will be played. So, you know, maybe pick up a copy. It's only like a buck. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Teardrop Kami. Teardrop Kami is a single U, single blue mana for a 1-1 spirit. Sack it, tap or untap target creature. And the flavor text... Do not fall into the trap of thinking you understand the kami. Cannot a drop of water be dew on the meadow, a glacier's thaw, or the tear of a child? Sensei Hisoka. This is a pretty cool card. Uh, I don't think it has many applications in our cube. I kind of want to come back to that to, to acknowledge the general coolness before we talk about this being bad. Uh, because it's it's kind of a it's a combo card, right? It combos with Kiki Jiki, it combos with Splinter Twin, it combos with Adarkar Valkyrie, like any of these cards. Um, you could sack the teardrop kami, untap a thing, bring back the teardrop kami, untap the thing that uh, created the teardrop kami. You can just re keep recurring that and anything that cares about creatures ending their battlefield or creatures dying will proc off that so you can get a kill off a of blood artist or any number of similar effects. So I, I like this as like a single mana, really quirky uh, kind of combo enabler. Uh, I don't think it can really do any of that stuff into the cube uh, because we don't like have much that lets us exploit these abilities or synergize with the sack effects, uh, but it's a cool card. It's definitely a card that like makes me want to figure out what it could be doing in the cube or what it's, you know, what it's supposed to be doing in Kamigawa Limited. And sadly, I think the answer is not much. Like there just aren't that many things you'd care about tapping or untapping. And there there isn't really the ability a way within Kamigawa to get a lot of payoff from like a recursive ETB effect or dying effect. There aren't that many ways to get things back from the graveyard or creatures back in or blink them. I, I like this little guy in theory, but I'm not sure what he's supposed to be doing. Yeah, when I was looking at the spoiler, there are 44 creatures in the block that have tap abilities. Only six of those are in blue though. And almost all of the Kamigawa tap in creatures require some kind of mana cost as input. Uh, and all of blues do. And blues are generally expensive. They're like X or they're three mana or they're two mana. Uh, so I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't see this being very exploitable. Uh, and therefore, because it's not very exploitable, it doesn't strike me as all that interesting. Like I think most of the time what this can do is, I don't know, 
chump and then I mean, I was going to say chump and then give your untap your creature, but who cares? You've already had blocks. So that doesn't matter. <laughs> right. um, I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. It doesn't do I much. I guess it can kind of uh, can get you a little closer to lethal because you're tapping down a potential blocker maybe. Yeah. So that's something. Yeah. It's, it's a very small something. I guess this this is a card that sort of highlights uh, a rules difference between magic at the time this was printed and magic now which is damage going on the stack yeah it's been a while since we've uh we've filled the damage on the stack bingo card you want to briefly explain that rule for anyone who's not familiar um i'll i'll do my best let me know if i'm getting this wrong at all but at, at this time in magic this is no longer the case but at this time damage uh like combat damage from teardrop kami uh would go on the stack just like a spell or an ability which means that your teardrop kami can swing in deal some damage or deal some damage as a blocker and then be sacked and you get the benefit of the damage and that sacrifice ability. Uh, Whereas in modern magic, the damage would not go on the stack, meaning if you blocked with your teardrop Kami and then sacked it, you wouldn't get the combat damage, but you would get the sacrifice ability. Yeah, and that doesn't matter too much for a teardrop Kami, but it does matter for a lot of other cards uh, in this environment. So we actually play uh, the cube with damage on the stack for cards like, for example, Frostling, which is just a 1-1 for a single R that can sack itself to deal a damage to a creature. The damage on the stack allows Frostling to block as a 2-1, right? Because it can deal one damage or put its damage on the stack, sack to deal another damage and kill an X2 attacker. And so there's a lot of little synergies like that or bigger synergies that matter uh, with damage on the stack. But I think with teardrop Kami, it's, it's a lot more academic. I mean, because like, who, who cares? It's one damage. <laughs> it doesn't actually matter because you'd want to be d- doing the tapping before blockers are declared anyway. At the same time, though, there are only two other blue one drops left in the cube if we cut this, both of which are not great. So if, if we cut this and we also cut those other two, then blue will have no one mana creatures, which may, you know, maybe that's something that is totally fine. Uh, but by comparison, white currently has 14 one drops in the cube. So I think the real question with teardrop Kami is given that this this can potentially do something, unlike the remaining one drops that we have, do we want to have any one mana creatures in blue in the cube? I'm fine with blue not having any one mana creatures. I feel like we've we've put in some decent two mana defensive creatures in blue, like Floating Dream Zubera, Guardian of Solitude, Kaijin of the Vanishing Touch. So I, I think I'm I'm just I'm okay with blue not having bad one drops, and I think blue's better off without them. Okay, that's fair. All the one drops are bad, so <laughs> <laughs> that adds up. I saw you had a comment about the flavor text here. Do you wanna do you wanna share your comment? <laughs> oh yeah. Well the flavor text here starts with do not fall into the trap of thinking you understand the kami. It continues, cannot a drop of water be dew on the meadow, a glacier's thaw, or the tear of a child. What does that mean? Like I read this and I'm like, do not fall into the trap of thinking you understand the kami or this flavor text. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, I, I normally try to go easy on the kind of like pseudo philosophical flavor text, but we've had, uh, what, four, right? We had reduce the dreams. You know, this world is a dream. We cling to our toys like children. Um, ribbons of the Reiki, if wisdom is a river. We've had a stream of consciousness. All things return to their beginning. Like there's just, <laughs> there's too many in this set of these kind of like dong, like, deep sounding flavor texts that don't really mean anything or don't mean much and especially don't mean much in the context of this card like i don't yeah i'm I'm with you this flavor text it's it's trying a little too or there's too many of these kind of trying too hard flavor texts and also these are all attributed to either dosa on the falling leaf or hisoka um who i guess are the only two wise people in kamigawa and i i hate hisoka i'm on record his art is lame he's kind of a lame meaningless character in the story he's just he's just a dork so i don't want to hear more about sensei hisoka well i I, i'm glad that we learned from phantom wings that uh hidetsugu kills him (laughs) yeah i'm good i'm i'm glad uh is this an insta cut for you or are you going to try to mount a defense no i i think we can we can let him go all right okay Uh, we've got an interesting one here threads of disloyalty one uu for an enchantment aura enchant creature with mana value two or less you control enchanted creature. The flavor text says, over time, Kanda grew ever more suspicious, fearing even his most loyal allies were being manipulated by unseen hands. And this this flavor text is attributed to the history of Kamigawa instead of Dosan or Sensei Hisoka. So thank goodness for that. <laughs> so this this is an interesting card to me. It comes in at one mana below kind of the, the archetypical control magic cost of four. Um, but I do think 
you lose a, a pretty good amount of playability for that one mana save. This can only grab creatures that cost less than the card itself uh, because it's limited to creatures with a uh, mana value of two or less. Um, and I think that that takes away a lot of the the kind of two for one power of control magic effects because you can kind of, by definition, never really trade up with Threads of Disloyalty. Yeah, it's a super it's a super challenging card to evaluate, which I, I kind of like. Like so on the one hand, it's got it's got some of the classic advantages of control magic, right? Like the two key things of it's a two for one, right? Like you're getting you're playing one card, you're getting your opponent's creature, and now they have to deal with that creature. Uh, and so if you trade off, for example, that's a two for one. So that that's still here, albeit with a caveat. Um, it's still somewhat flexible removal. Like one of the things that makes control magic great is it's just like kill your opponent's best permanent, get a really good permanent, which is crazy. And this is more like kill a me reasonable thing and get a reasonable thing, which isn't terrible, right? It's still pretty decent. The downside, as you said, is like you're not getting your opponent's best thing and you're not trading up in value and mana, which uh, those are both pretty huge. I still think this is kind of better than it looks like if I think if I try to stop thinking about control magic, which is a, a very good card, incidentally, and I just think about this as like, I don't know, like murder, right? Like murder is like three mana kill a thing. It's not good enough for modern magic, but it was good enough. OK, environments for quite a while. Um, this is kind of like compares OK to murder, right? It's like three mana kill a reasonable thing, maybe kill a second reasonable thing. Like I'm okay with that set of trade-offs. It's also, I think our only control magic effect in the block, except uh, of course, Kega, uh, the Tide Star, who's an insanely good control magic effect, but this is, this is pretty decent still. Well, we do, we do have another control magic effect in black coming up. Um, what? Not a great one. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But to be fair to Threads of Disloyalty, I think you, you raise a good point that control magic is... A very good card and as far as i can tell control magic is the only four mana value effect of its type that doesn't have some kind of downside or restriction associated with it like every other control magic type aura that costs four mana has some sort of limitation to it or comes with some kind of downside so you know it's, yeah, it's, it's literally just yeah. yeah it's literally just control magic itself that you know takes the creature with hmm. no limitation so you know Keeping that in mind when we look at threads of disloyalty helps. This is not about threads of disloyalty, but I, I love that that I love that little point of trivia. Like, how rare is that that something from Alpha is not outright broken, like Black Lotus or Ancestral Recall, but also has never been bettered? Uh, like that is so that is so cool and interesting. Yeah. So that that other control magic effect that we have uh, in the block is coming up, up in black, and that's Mark of the Oni, which is oh! a, a three mana enchant creature. Oh. It can take anything just like control magic, and do it for three mana. But at your end step, you have to sacrifice Mark of the Oni unless you control a demon. And based on some recent playtesting that we've done, it is very hard to control a demon. <laughs> it's so hard to control Or to a find demon. a demon long enough to make Mark of the Oni stick. Also, as far as I can tell, those these two cards, Threads of Disloyalty and Mark of the Oni, are the only three mana control magic auras in the game. And they're both in this set. I love that. So file, file that one away. That's the heart of clock spinning right there. That kind of data. Yeah, check that off on your bingo card. Uh, okay, so wh where do you land? I have this at a playable. Like I started down at the kind of meh range, but the more I thought about it, I thought, I think this is going to play better than it reads. I think it's more powerful than it reads. Yeah, I, th I think it's just a, a cool, good card. Yeah, you know, I, th I think you're right. I had it at meh 1x, but the more we talk about it, the more playable I feel like it's going to be. So let's go with playable. How about this art, by the way? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's strange. Yeah, it's like Anthony S. Waters channeling some kind of Rebecca Gway watercolor energy here, and it's a um, it's it's pretty literal. It's like a Arachi or snake person shaman being controlled by some blue threads with some super wackadoodle eyes, and apparently, what the threads want him to do is like do squats. Um, like mm -hmm. it's not <laughs> not totally maybe, clear like, what be halfway falling over. Yeah, I guess not him. It's a, uh, it's got, he's got snake, uh, snake, or she's got snake uh, boobies, which are surprisingly really? common, incidentally, in Kamigawa. Yeah, there's a lot of snake cleavage going on. The the art there doesn't. I'm not sure what the disloyalty is, other than just uh, 
I, I guess Akami is controlling her. Well, yeah, rather than uh, also, I mean, was Kanda really close with the snake people or something? Like the flavor text isn't quite meeting the art here. Um, <laughs> That's a very good point. Like who who is this, this Orochi that uh, has a relationship with Kanda? Hmm. Oh boy, what oh. is Kanda's relationship with this oh, interesting. busty Orochi? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, two other little points of trivia before we uh, move on. Oh, uh, wait, so what's the rating? I- I'm playable 1x. I th- I is think, that map for I you? I think we're, uh, we're zeroing in on playable 1x, yeah. All right, let's do it. Uh, before we move off, I've got two other bits of trivia. Um, one is, uh, this was printed somewhat inexplicably to my mind as an Amonkhet Invocation. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, the Invocations were um, like a series of Amonkhet cards with special art uh, that all had kind of a theme. They were all Grixis colors or artifacts and they all had a theme. Or no, they were all Grixis. No, they weren't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they all had a theme of of Nicol Bolas's repressive reign over Amonkhet. They all had unique art. They all had these really crazy kind of ancient Egypt frames. Uh, and this card has the dubious distinction of being the cheapest of the Amonkhet invocations by some measure. So it doesn't have a huge amount of play. Uh, and then one other thing is in, in standard, this actually saw a good amount of play in a quirky deck called Owling Mine. Owling Mine was like an anti-control tech deck that just forces uh, both players to draw a ton of cards uh, with Howling Mine uh, and just keeps all your opponent's permanents off the board with like Boomerang and Eye of Nowhere. You just keep bouncing their land. And then eventually you kill them with Ebony Owl Netsuke, a card we're going to talk about in our Saviors review, on Sudden Impact, another kind of Saviors card. And basically just, yeah, keeps your opponent drawing cards, bouncing their stuff, and eventually punishes them for having a full hand. And this saw play in the sideboard pretty extensively uh, as just a way to have some kind of hope against aggro because that deck really, really struggled with aggro because it was so hard tacked against control. That's a pretty awesome deck though. It's a super, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link a really nice Owling Mine guide from uh, Star City Games uh, back in the day. It's a really fun read, just a really unique deck and a, a good write-up. All right, let's talk about Toils of Night and Day. To you for an instant arcane, tap or untap target permanent, then tap or untap another target permanent. And the flavor text, the war sent Kamigawa into turmoil. Here it was spring and there winter. For some time stood still, while for for others, moments flashed past like minnows in a pond. Observations of the Kami War. So this card is polarized in my mind. I love the name, like Toils of Night and Day. I think that is such a cool name. It's got quite good art. It's got this trippy, like double dragon art of a red dragon and a blue dragon, one night, one day. Uh, It's got, I think, very evocative, nice flavor text. And then like so many of these arcane spells, I get stuck on the effect in the mana cost. Like this is another card that isn't worth a card. And it's, uh, it's frustrating. Like I'm worried we're just destroying the arcane deck, but I also... I don't know that it deserves to live. I just, I don't know what to do with this card. Like so many of these arcane things. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what the arcane deck even is, right? Like what could we be destroying when none of the cards do anything? Yeah, exactly. Like, can you really build like, uh, okay. If we were to somehow try to work dampened thought back into the cube, for example, like, is this relevant to the dampened thought deck? Like, is this even high enough impact to like tap down their two attackers, I guess, and splice on a dampened thought and just stall out a little bit. I don't know. Maybe I need to have faith, but I just really struggle to see that getting there. You know, one, one of the things I noticed in Kamigawa is it's a it's a very bomb-driven format because so many of the cards are so bad, right? And so your opponent and you are kind of, there's a lot of pressure to tick up towards a dragon or a, just a big flyer or Maloku or some kind of game-ending threat. And like, I just, I don't know. Like, can you really just stall with Toils of Night and Day and these other bad cards and the hope that you eventually w- like eke out a win? I, I struggle to see it. Yeah, it's. It, I I like the idea of piecing something together with Damp and Thought and Toils of Night and Day and all these other arcane spells. I think the reality is probably going to be that the player trying to do that just gets clapped by Kokusho, the Evening Star, and that's <laughs> GG. Yep. Yeah, and that that speaks to one of the fundamental tensions in our cubes design, right? Because we're not emulating a retail draft environment. We do have more of those bomby cards. We have more Isamaru's running around applying aggro pressure. Like we're not trying to strictly emulate retail draft, which comes with some good things, but I think also comes at a cost to some of these slower, funkier decks uh, that that existed in Kamigawa Limited. Yeah. Uh, is that an insta-cut for you, Connor? It is, though I, I do need to second that I, I love the name, I love the art, uh, the flavor text is pretty cool, but yeah, the card, the card itself, I don't think uh, we can find any home for. Okay, next up we have Tomorrow, Azami's Familiar. 5U for a legendary 1-5 spirit. 
that says, if you would draw a card, look at the top three cards of your library instead. Put one of those cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. This card is really an enigma to me. He only, according to EDH Rec, only commands 96 decks. But if you look at Reddit, r slash EDH, it is full of discussions of tomorrow in Commander specifically, like how to run a tomorrow deck involving all sorts of different wacky combos, how to integrate tomorrow into a deck with another commander. Like there's a lot of discussion of this card. For example, one of those decks uses tomorrow as Ami's familiar and laboratory maniac, uh, which lets you win the game if you would draw the last card in your deck. So the goal is to just draw through your whole deck and use laboratory maniac to sort of win by default. Wait, uh, wait, how did, how does this work with Lab Man? Because he tomorrow stops you from drawing cards. Well, so the idea is that you use tomorrow to dig through your deck very, very quickly. And your deck is a whole bunch of blue mana or, you know, blue spells that draw a bunch of cards. Um, so you're using tomorrow's filtering ability to find cards that let you draw as much as possible, basically, or to find other cards that give you, you know, more mana to be able to continue drawing cards. So tomorrow yeah, sounds like, like the hardest lab man victory ever. <laughs> yeah. So it's a lot of work. Uh, even more work is the possessed portal win. I'm here. I'm ready. Let me just read exactly what that card does. So we can get the full picture here. Possessed portal is an eight mana artifact from fifth dawn that says if a player would draw a card, that player skips that draw instead. At the beginning of each end step, each player sacrifices a permanent unless they discard a card. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. So, so possessed portal uh, has a triggered effect that replaces your drawing a card. Tomorrow also has a triggered effect that replaces drawing a card. It's a replacement effect, right? It's not a trigger. Like, how, well, how yeah, that, yeah, it's a are replacement. Getting into effect. layers here. Which one takes? <laughs> they, so, so if if these people on Reddit are correct, I'm, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And say that they are. <laughs> These are replacement effects. So if you have both tomorrow and possess portal on the battlefield, when you would draw a card, you choose to re- you choose tomorrow's replacement effect to get this filtering instead of drawing a card. When your opponents mm-hmm. would draw a card, possessed portal applies instead, and they don't draw a card. And instead, they sacrifice permanence at the end of their turns. It's, it's like the world's worst, most expensive stacks, <laughs> stacks yeah. combo. You're, you're trying to force your opponents to just concede out of misery. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So it doesn't sound fun for anyone, but there, there's a surprising amount of discussion of how to use tomorrow hmm. to achieve that goal. Yeah. As, uh, as you were saying that I looked at this Reddit thread you were talking about, which I should link. It's a great thread. Yeah. Apparently lab man is a similar sort of deal where you choose the replacement effect. So you don't need it tomorrow to leave the battlefield in order, in order to win with lab man, which is great. That makes it much more viable. <laughs> Absolutely. You just need to get through all 99 cards. Yeah. I struggled with this one. It's a very cool card, right? Like anything that says every time you draw a card brain kind of brainstorm or brainstormy effect, that's cool. Everyone, like everybody likes doing that, but I, I don't know. Like the stats here. Are okay. Like a one five, isn't the worst. He sure blocks for days. Um, he was like a one five with reach, which would be very unblue, but you know, would help a lot here. Uh, or if it was like a two five or a one six, like I think the stats could stand to be a little better because the ability here is not card advantage right it's kind of virtual card advantage like you're getting so much card selection that i think the idea is that you will you know eventually overwhelm your opponent with your sheer card quality but like in blue you're already drawing cards so i don't think you really need that virtual card selection that much especially at the six drop (laughs) slot and when i've played this thing i don't know it didn't get me out of any holes having the extra card selection was nice but not enough to make up for kind of being a do nothing card. The other thing is we're definitely going to have to make some cuts at the six drop slot for blue. We actually have eight six drops creatures oh, wow. in blue right now. Um, now some of those we've yet to review, but actually just like one or two. We've we've somehow managed to let like six six mana plus blue creatures slip in. We've got uh Jetting Glass Kite, Kega the Tide Star, Sire of the Storm, Tomorrow, Uyo Silent Prophet, Patron of the Moon, The Unspeakable, and then coming up in Saviors we'll have Sora Maro First to Dream. And I don't know, that seems like too many really expensive blue creatures. It's it's a good number. <laughs> Yeah, we we might have to winnow those down a little. I think the struggle with tomorrow, especially in this cube setting that we're looking at him in, is that this this ability just comes too late. Like this would be a great thing to have earlier in the game. 
maybe by turn three or something. Three but, mana, one three. Yeah. Getting this filtering on turn six, probably at the earliest, is just too little too late. Like if, if I'm at six mana already, I want it to be, you know, something like the Jetting Glass Kite or Kega. Uh, or patron of the moon, or something that you know is allowing you to to close out the game, or, or impacts the board in a substantial way, right? Like Jet and Glass Guy comes down and it says, "Answer my four four flyer with basically shroud." This doesn't really ask your opponent to do much. Like they can keep even attacking into this, right? If they've got a bunch of bears, they're like, "Okay, uh, swing in with my three uh, gray ogres," and you go, "Okay, I chump, I block one." But like, it's just, I don't know. I don't think it 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 doesn't. Even for this era of magic, it's so not proactive. I just think you need you need more in a six drop. Yeah. There was sort of a, an interesting and uh, as far as I can see, like unique flavor uh, suggestion here that we haven't seen on any cards so far, which uh, is that tomorrow... What what you find, Siri? <laughs> yeah, what you got, Siri? On, oh, no, no. on tomorrow is obviously familiar. The twenty five funniest flavor suggestions we've ever gotten on BenandJerry dot com. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it could be a fun little read. Um, but tomorrow is apparently Azami's familiar, and Azami, if you'll remember, was a human wizard uh, that we talked about back in Champions of Kamigawa. And the suggestion here, of course, is that tomorrow is somehow uh, bound to Azami or serves her in some way, which I don't think we've seen on any other spirit. Yeah, that that is cool. I like that. Uh, I like that little bit of kind of lore intrigue. It's also kind of like you think of a familiar, you usually think of like a tiny little imp or a crow that's sitting on your shoulder. And this guy's like a big honking freaky frog man. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, Or just a, a tiny familiar with a big butt. Yeah. And the name tomorrow, like it's named tomorrow. What an interesting name. Yeah. I don't know. I'm an insta cut on this, Connor. I just think we're going to have to make probably a couple of cuts at the uh, six plus mana slot in blue. And this one feels pretty cuttable to me. Like it's unique, but it's it's just, it's too, too bad. Yeah. I I wasn't mad, but now that now that I know how many six, six mana blue creatures we have, I think something's got to go. All right. Next up, Veil of Secrecy. One and a U for an instant arcane. Target creature gains Shroud until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. And it's got Splice onto Arcane. Return a blue creature you control to its owner's hand. And this is actually our first Splice card of the whole uh, episode. So Splice, again, is as you cast an Arcane spell, you may reveal this card from your hand and pay its Splice cost. If you do, add this card's effects to that spell. All right. So I, I really, really like this thing. So I read this as basically a ninja enabler. Ninjas obviously like to get unblockable. They are small and fragile and they appreciate getting shroud. They uh, appreciate recursive ability to get in, uh, which the splice is great for here. Um, and they also like being bounced back to your hand to do more ninjutsu things. So I don't know. I'm pretty, pretty high on Veil of Secrecy. I don't think it's an amazing card, but I think it's a cool card that does Kind of compared to all these other terrible blue arcane cards we've talked about today, it's like a blue arcane card that does the things the rest of the car blue cards in the set want to do, uh, which is nice. Yeah, I mean, speaking of ninja enabling, the the art also clearly shows a ninja, a ninja sneaky. Just in just in case the ability uh, didn't set up for the reader that this was uh, meant to work with ninjas, it it shows a ninja in the art. So that. That Which helps. is really confusing, right? Like this is where the whole spirit <sighs> mortal thing like that we've been talking about on and off this episode breaks down again, right? Yep. Of why uh, there's, there's, so if the whole set is supposed to be about lore, there is no lore reason that I know of for the Kami to intervene and go, all right, let's help these ninjas get in and steal things. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, it's yeah, I don't know. Arcane is, Arcane is a cool idea, but I can, I, when we started this review, oh my goodness, almost a year ago, I was I was frustrated that Wizards had never revisited Arcane, but the more we talk about it and play with it, like it, it just doesn't quite work. It's an it's an ability that it's an effect that doesn't play very nicely. It it seems synergistic, but it's too parasitic. It just doesn't work. Yeah, I I wrote in my notes that this is like a reverse Arcane confusion card. We've seen a lot of spells that look like they should be Arcane and they're not. Uh, this is one of the few where <laughs> it is Arcane and it feels like it shouldn't be based on the art and I guess kind of what it does. Um, but I, I think it's, it is like made better and more fun and more interesting by the fact that it is arcane, right? This is something you'd actually want to play and want to splice things onto. And it, it comes with its own splice ability. 
Yeah, do we have any do we have any arcane spells left for this to splice onto at this point? No, there's gotta be something. Yeah, it looks like we, we kept a lot of champions ones in, like uh consuming vortex, which is like a, a mediocre bounce spell, peer through depths, psychic puppetry. So we we've got some uh some a few arcane spells still in the cube. Not not as many as we would hope. You know, we have the uh, glacial ray and eye of nowhere. We've discussed uh putting hundred talent strike back in. So there's there's a few things for this to build off of. Okay, I, I'm I'm open to bringing 100 Talent Strike. Dampen Thought, I think I need to give a little more thought to, especially since we were just dumping on it earlier when we talked about that sword, Tommy. We've been talking about like maybe around halfway through Betrayers at the end of Betrayers doing like a kind of mini episode where we just talk about our playtesting and the cube so far. And I feel like in that, we need a dedicated chat about blue and the cube because I feel like blue is really struggling compared to the other colors for me with identity and playability and like its internal synergies. Like I'm, I'm struggling to understand blue and the more cards we talk about, the less I understand it. Yeah, I I think that's that's fair. I was going to say about the splice cost on this. It's nice that it has splice, but this feels like a pretty high price to pay, returning a blue creature you control to its owner's hand. So you have your Veil of Secrecy. You're playing it, I think, ideally to enable some kind of ninja sneakiness, right? So you play your Veil of Secrecy to make something unblockable so that you can ninjutsu out a ninja with that unblocked creature. Or, or to save something, maybe. Or maybe to save something. But let's say you're doing it for the, the most ninja, ninja-y thing you could play this card for, which is to enable ninjutsu. So you play your Veil of Secrecy. The creature that you're targeting with the Veil of Secrecy is going to be bounced to your hand when you ninjutsu out a ninja with it. And if you're splicing the Veil of Secrecy, you're bouncing another creature to your hand. You're losing two creatures to get one ninja out. That feels like a pretty, pretty high tempo cost to be paying. But I don't think of it as a cost. I think of it more as like, sort of like Arcane Wings earlier, like a variety of play modes, right? Like, so for example, sometimes returning the thing is an advantage because you want a ninjutsu again, or you want to get an ETB trigger again. Sometimes it's an advantage because this can actually protect two creatures, right? You can give one shroud and then bounce another one to hand to save it from dying. Like if we go back to our eternal damage on the stack, like they're, I don't know, actually that doesn't really, shroud doesn't help you with damage on the stack actually, but like it's not always, I guess, going to be a cost that you have to return a blue creature. It's actually yeah. pretty marginal because I can't think of a lot of times you'd have two creatures targeted by removal at the same time. So I don't, maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting a little too Baroque here. Like the, the example I was giving is just sort of one specific use case for this card, which I, you know, doubt would be the most common example of when you would actually play this given how many blue ninjas there actually are. I like this card. I think it it can have a role in, in potentially multiple copies. Yeah, so I went crazy and gave this a playable 3x. I think that was just end of rating loopiness. I think the 3x part, but I do think this is pretty playable. I'll stick to that rating. Okay, I, I had it at a meh 2x. I feel like two is a reasonable number. You know, I don't, I don't think we necessarily want to have three of these floating around or be seeing three of these come up in a draft. Yeah, it would just clog your hand and clog the draft, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think I can agree on playable. Yeah, you will you can come up to playable and I'll come down to two. How about that? All right. All right, you want to take us home? I do, and I'm, I'm happy to be taking us home with a ninja. Walker of Secret Ways. Great name. To you for a one-two human ninja with ninjutsu one you. And I think this is uh, the only ninja we've talked about in today's episode. So as a reminder... Uh, the way ninjutsu works is you pay that cost of one U, return an unblocked attacker you control to hand, and put this card onto the battlefield from your hand, tapped and attacking. And then whenever Walker of Secret Ways deals combat damage to a player, look at that player's hand. It also has an activated ability. You can pay one and a U to return target ninja you control to its owner's hand. Activate only during your turn. So this is this is an interesting card that does some pretty unusual things first off just looking at a player's hand as a standalone ability is pretty uncommon and i i don't think really appears on any magic cards nowadays <laughs> just letting you look at a hand without doing anything to it it has this this interesting ninja enabling and ninja specific activated ability there's a lot going on here 
Yeah, it's a it's a really complicated or there's a lot of like bells and whistles on this card. Starting with uh, your observation that this look at a player's hand thing doesn't really exist anymore is spot on. Uh, so I'll link this scryfall search, but uh, this is I think the third to last pure look at hand effect ever printed. So after this, we have uh, famously Gataxian Probe, um, which just looks just quote unquote looks at another player's hand. But of course, like the real thing Gataxian Probe does is like cycle through your deck for zero mana. Uh, and build storm count for zero mana and do all kinds of other degenerate things. And then in cons of Tarkir, we got Dragon's Eye Savants, which is like a two mana 06 morph that when it gets turned face up, looks at an opponent's hand, which I think, as far as I can tell, is the last pure look at an opponent's hand without doing anything about it card ever printed in Magic. So this this effect was tailing off at this point. And I think for good reason, because it's like, A, not really worth a card, uh, to look at your opponent's hand and B it, it kind of sucks from a gameplay perspective. Like obviously it's frustrating for your opponent, right? It's like, Oh, I lost my hidden information, but I, honestly, as the player who gets to look at the hand, quote unquote gets, I don't really like having that perfect information. Like it leads, it removes some of the mystery from the game. So there's a fun factor thing there, but it also creates this like memorization thing. of like, Oh, do I have to like write down the cards that were in my opponent's hand and then try to remember them? Like, it's just, it's just not a very fun. I don't, I don't find that effect fun. Uh, like at all. I, I find it just kind of boring. Yeah, I, f- I feel like without the kind of, uh, you know, MTG arena effect of being able to, you know, continue to see cards that have been revealed from your opponent's hand, uh huh, uh huh, which obviously was not a thing when this was printed in 2005. Uh, yeah, that, that kind of memory game element and then also needing to be, you know, it, it's one thing to kind of be thinking, okay, what kind of removal might my opponent have? What sort of responses might come up if I try to do this thing? That feels different and kind of more interesting than knowing what your opponent has and then just wondering when they're going to decide to play it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. The ability here is kind of interesting too, right? Like usually when you see a timing restriction on an ability, it's activate this only when you can play a sorcery. But this is activate this ability only during your turn. And I, I, I was puzzling over that. And I think the reason is it lets you do some kind of funky interactions with ninjutsu, right? So ninjutsu just cares about your attacker being unblocked. So you can actually pick up a ninja, maybe a ninja that got blocked, and then put it back into play for an unblocked creature because you oh. you have you can do that any time during the blocker step, right? You don't have to just do it. You see what I'm saying? Like, okay, it, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it it reads. It actually plays. I think a little better than it reads. Like, I I kind of dislike that this card is hard to understand. But I think really what it lets you do is like pick up a ninja, put it back down on whatever didn't get blocked. So I think it does more than it looks like to help your ninjas get through. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I didn't didn't think about that little wrinkle to it. It's it's convoluted as all get out. <laughs> I I wonder how how often that that ends up being useful. But I I like the potential there. I don't think a ton. Yeah, I but I feel like the biggest there there's like I, I think a few reasons that that activated ability I think a lot of the time ends up kind of doing nothing on this card. The first one is that this can only target ninjas. It has to be target ninja that you're returning. To your hand it can't be another creature you can't use this uh, as a way to protect things unless they're a ninja uh, so that's a big limiting factor another issue here is that part of the power of ninjutsu part of the power of that sneakiness is that your opponent doesn't know that it's coming and if you're bouncing a ninja that you already have in play to your owner's hand and then playing it again then you know maybe maybe there's some sneakiness because your opponent isn't sure whether you're going to do that but you know if you have the Walker of Secret Ways and another ninja in play, then your opponent knows that you have that option. Uh, or at least they do after Austin explains how this ability works. <laughs> See, I read that more as like a um, an onboard effect, a, a trick, like um, Fires of Yavimaya or something, where, yeah, your opponent knows, but that doesn't really make their life much easier, right? It's kind of like all their attempts to block your ninjas from getting through can be stymied and like you get to make the call once they've you know made their blocking decisions you get to kind of mess with whatever they're trying to to do right like i i read that as almost an advantage like a kind of psychological advantage of yeah i get the i kind of get the last word on whether my ninjutsu ability is active um you know what we don't normally include cards for the art but i feel like if there's ever a card that merits inclusion on the art it might be this one do you want to talk about the art here oh it it is so good but but pretty hard to describe. <laughs> so the the Walker of Secret Ways is shown just from like the waist up in kind of a cool ninja-like pose. She's holding some sort of sword in the backhand and then 
doing, I guess, some kind of secret ways magic with the other hand in this, not not really a dynamic pose, but just a, a really cool, evocative look, very like ninja-ish. Uh, and then the background is this, this really interesting like base color of sort of a, a yellow, like a sunset with a forest in kind of the distant background. And then right behind the ninja that's the subject of the art, uh, there's this kind of vertical stripe of this purple magenta kind of transparency that's setting her off from that distant background a little bit more. And then it has this cryptic sort of mystical pattern laid on over that as well. So it all kind of comes together to create this this enigmatic figure centered around this ninja who has these mystical powers. And it's it's not entirely clear, like, you know, how this this art connects to the ability, but it, you know, has ha- comes together in this really almost abstract, uh, but like still very evocative way. Yeah, Scott M. Fisher did an, has done a number of pieces like this, basically starting in Kamigawa Block. Um, and he's continued to do kind of off and on this, uh, this style of kind of a hyper-realistic figure mixed with some interesting abstract elements within the art itself. Uh, and I, I really uh, love it. I think it's uh, it's super evocative. It's it's totally unique calling card. And it's really visually really cool. Uh, the only strike against it is I uh, I dislike... Um, there, it's not a boob window. It's not even exactly a butt window. It's like a kind of lower back, upper butt window um, to expose her, I guess, two red dot tattoos. I just find that a little too silly. I'm I'm fine with the the design of the armor, but the red dots look super awkward. It's like that part of her back is facing directly at the viewer, and then there's this awkward torso twist happening. Um, what about the rating? So I don't think this is actually. I have this at a Meh One X, but I think is this another one that really is more like a build around? Like this is kind of the sneaky second ninja lord, right? I guess this really is a build around. I mean, the fact that the activated ability can only target ninjas, I feel like makes it a build around by definition. Right. Like Ninja of the Deep Hours, you might just throw that into a deck that has some flyers just to be able to draw cards. Like this thing is only going in a deck that's that's got a lot of ninjas. Yeah. I think this has got to be build around. How many do you think? I feel like this almost demands two, like if it's going to work. I just don't see having one of these ever being... Right, like you need a certain density. One of the problems with ninjas is there's not enough freaking ninjas in the block. So I feel like all of them kind of demand to be doubled up on. Yeah, yeah. It's it's awkward because one of these just feels like it it does nothing. Two of them almost feels like it's it's gonna be appearing too often for the the number of other ninjas that you're able to actually get. But I, I feel like for now we we go a little bit heavier on ninjas and then dial it back if we need to. Yeah, I think uh, people people want to see ninjas in a Kamigawa block cube. So I feel like we got to bend over backwards a little bit to get enough of them in here, even when they're not great. You know, pe- people including these two people. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Build around 2x. All right, that is it for Betrayers of Kamigawa Blue. Uh, We have undergone many toils of night and day to bring you this obscure trivia, and we hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for joining our streams of consciousness as we tear the veil of secrecy off these ancient cards. Love it. If you have enjoyed uh, any of this show or or whether that's our bad puns or um, obscure ancient scryfall searches, we're glad to hear it. And we hope you can share it with a friend, posting it to a Discord channel, texting it to a friend. It really helps uh, new people discover the show. Uh, and it means a lot to us knowing that people are listening to it and enjoying it. Um, if you are new to the show and you enjoyed it, I'd also recommend following it on YouTube or subscribing to your podcast app. We aim to release an episode every two weeks, but sometimes life gets in the way and we can go through a little hiatuses. And that's a good way to make sure you don't miss an episode. Speaking of, next time we've got... A- a very special topical episode coming up that uh, we're really excited about before we go back to more Betrayers of Kamigawa goodness. So I'm excited about that. And that's coming very soon. But until then, I'm Austin. And I'm Connor. Thanks for listening. <laughs>